Best Book Bits podcast brings you Aaron Baer, strategist, entrepreneur, and author. He's also held leadership roles in strategy, innovation, technology, marketing, and sales. He's a results-focused, exponential leader who understands how to create high-performing cultures. Aaron has been a lecturer on innovation and entrepreneurship for over 10 years. He's a global facilitator, traveled to over 90 countries and all 50 states. Aaron is a certified big historian, certified professional philosopher, and was the creator of the Oxford Leadership Online Certified Coach, which is in closing on over 1 million participants. Aaron, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate having me. No worries. Now, your life resume continues and grows, so we'll jump into some of that soon. You're the author of the book, Exponential Theory, The Power of Thinking Big. I recently read it, an amazing book, and we'll jump into that too. But for my audience who don't know you, take us back to the early years. Give us a bit of a rundown on your story and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, so I, I think my my exponential journey is is like the what I like to call it. I started... Um, Really, when I when I was about 20 years old, and uh, I was from a, a small town in the Midwest, um, in Indiana, and I actually uh, embarked on a journey uh, to travel around the world, and flew to the Bahamas, and, and ended up circumnavigating the world on a boat uh, that brought me back to Seattle and um, back to America on the you know going all the way around the world and. During that, I went in and out of all these different co- countries and cultures and really um, got to see that the world's uh, a lot uh, smaller than I thought, but also that there's a lot bigger opportunity when you when you have a point of view, you know, of the world. So um, that started an, expo, an accelerated learning journey where I just began to eat up books and uh, obstacles and wanted to learn at a, at a vigorous pace um, that led me to do in research for about 15 years about what what some of our world's biggest thinkers, how they created their mindset, belief, and attitude. So in that, that's infused in exponential theory, the power of thinking big, where we go through several different exponential companies as well as exponential thinkers to how they got there. And also, you know, part of that goal is to, to share the story in a way where we have some reflection questions so that you can individually um, professionally or organizationally apply that um, so you can see those stories and apply them to yourself. So that's ultimately the goal that'll lead into a new product we're creating called the Think Bigger course um, that really is the power of exponential theory, which reverses the book where we just help people think bigger by applying some of these uh, learnings in a way that um, we help companies think bigger, we help uh, you know people in their careers as well as uh, personally think bigger uh, through that. And I think that's, that's the overall, you know, product of exponential theory is if people think bigger, they become more conscious and we, we will create a better world when we start thinking about all the different, uh, stakeholders in an ecosystem, not just the ones, uh, that we're making a decision with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it takes no more effort to think big than it does to think small. So you might as well think big. And once you start expanding your mindset, obviously you start picking up on things that that fit that bigger belief as well but yeah i want to circle back to something you said um so the semester at sea you bought at the the u uh, sorry the ss universe 50 uh, 555 foot ocean liner talk about that so what was that like so getting on a boat what is it like a, a ship and traveling the world that would have been um that would have been exciting what what made you do that or how did you how did it lead up to to doing that well Part of it, it was a breakthrough. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. When I was, um, I went to a small school called uh, Indiana Tech, which was um, in Indiana. And it was not very far from Notre Dame University, which is um, uh, a, a very top ranked university that had a really good career center. So I actually broke into their career center um, <laughs> where um, I knew they could get a better internship at their university than mine. So I went uh, and took some interviews there and and literally during the interviews would tell the people that I actually didn't go to Notre Dame. And some of them really love the, uh, you know, the ingenuity of of knocking on that door. But that day, what what ended up happening, um, well, the biggest thing was I saw a poster for this thing called Semester at Sea. And I was like, I want to see the world. And at that point in my life, I didn't know anyone that had really traveled outside the United States, um, nor um, actually, you know, even, 
even traveled much out, you know, in, in the United States. So I myself, um, you know, signed up, raised uh, some money, worked really hard to get my funds up so I could afford this. And then literally flew off to the Bahamas and, and started that voyage with uh, 550 other students uh, that we circumnavigated the world. And I think th that experience of going in and out of those cultures, as I was saying, really started to expand my mindset of, you know, how, how we can impact on the world. But it also gave me a very global view uh, and a global point of view that I carry with me today. And since then, I've, I've now traveled to 90 countries and, you know, I've, I have traveled all 50 states and Guam and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, which are all, all, all part of the United States. But that was, you know, more than a checklist that ended up just being like an innovation journey to learn, you know, how people think big. And a lot of those countries I went to were with companies that I facilitated innovation and leadership. So I would go into companies like Daimler and Coca-Cola and Belfius Bank, which is the National Bank of Belgium. And I would take those companies into different ecosystems throughout the world. So Tel Aviv, Singapore, Shanghai, Shenzhen, London, Copenhagen, you know, Boston, New York, and even Silicon Valley and, and, and many, many more. All the places that you would say where the hottest innovation is happening. And we take these companies in and we you know, introduce them to a lot of the companies that are exponential, that are actually thinking bigger about one area of their business and how they were potentially going to disrupt those companies in the future. And that ultimately, you know, that journey of traveling and just continuing to want to travel led me back to exponential theory. I mean, so it interweaves a story as, as, as you travel the world, one, you know, I like to say, once you, you know, read a book, it doesn't matter what book it is, you know, the goal of that book should, you should never think the same way after you read that. And I hope, I hope Michael, you got that experience is like, you won't see the world the same way because all of a sudden, you know, each one of us now has the potential to impact the world. And, you know, part of that uh, exponential theory is, is as we do that, we're going to make the world a better place as we think bigger. And I think it becomes a priority and you actually stole one of my lines, um, but it doesn't take any more energy to, to think bigger. And I actually would share that um, what I say on top of that, because a lot of the book is about accelerated change is that, you know, change used to be constant, but I say now it's accelerating. Well, it's the, the same idea of thinking big doesn't take any more energy. I actually would say it takes less energy because you're not sweating the small stuff. You're not stressing. You don't have the stress, worries, anxieties of small stuff where every day I get up and I've launched my company's name is called One Million Exponential Leaders. And the goal is, is to impact this world by creating 1 million exponential leaders. That, you know, as I look into the future, it's a pretty big exponential goal. And I'd even say it's bigger than Google's first massive transformative purpose. Um, because if we were able to create 1 million exponential leaders, we potentially solve every problem on this planet and beyond. And I think that's part of getting that mindset um, where exponential theory does lead to how do we reimagine just about everything in the world, you know, to be better for all the stakeholders in the ecosystem, which is the goal of the book, you know, is to bring people to a place to actually start thinking about the rhodium rule, which I write in the book. Um, I'm sure most of our listeners have heard of the golden rule is to, to think about, you know, things in the way that, uh, that you would think about it. And then there's the platinum rule is to think about it, how others would think about it, you know, and with me too and cancel culture, I think that's really important today. Uh, but I went a step further to say, think about the rhodium rule, which rhodium is the most expensive metal, actually has platinum built in it. So all of a sudden you have the rhodium rule that is, think about the entire ecosystem. So instead of making decisions, you know, that'll benefit one group of people or one stakeholders, how do you actually think about those decisions for all people? How do you raise all tides? And I think it's part of the trend of being exponential is the end result of being exponential is the democratization of almost every industry and access, you know, for the world. And we're, we're seeing that. And, um, one of the most impactful lines that I hear a lot is, um, yes, the disparity between rich and poor, uh, may be widening in the world in different places. And that's obviously of concern. Um, but you also see this huge philanthropic generation from some of these rich people that have widened that may close that gap. I talk a little bit about that, but in that is that we're all still searching for the same electricity, battery life, and Wi-Fi. <laughs> so the widening gap, and we have access to the same entertainment platforms because that's been democratized. 
Um, we literally can, you know, through Airbnb and Ubers, um, when we travel, you know, we can have very similarly, similar experiences. So I think, you know, you see this widening gap, but we also see this democratization of every industry, which is part of the theory itself is as exponential, as something becomes digitized, we see the world has changed in a dramatic fashion very, very quickly. And it's, it's largely because those bits and bytes have, um, you know, been exponentially have, have transformed the world in such a fast pace that now it's accelerating where even Peter, um, Ray Kurzweil, who, uh, writes the law of accelerating returns, you know, that will in every 10 years, we could double to quadruple the change that's happening. And we're, we're seeing that on a, on a basis right now that, um, with 35 exponential technologies coming into market, as you stack those together, they disrupt every industry. And we, we play that game when we do strategic planning sessions with companies or what are all the exponential technologies that could disrupt your business. And it, it creates some interesting conversation and uh, fun conversations with executives because they'll, they'll learn about things that they never thought about before. And that's part of thinking bigger. Yeah, well said. And uh, just to go back on some of the things he said, so I do like a goal on what is it? One million exponential leaders. That's that's the vision. One one MXL. That's that's the name of the company, and we're we're focused on that. You know, or as we launch into the market, I think we're focused on helping you know entire companies. And I think one of the thing is democratizing this learning, so everyone in a company can culturally learn this. And we can bring everyone along to think bigger. And that creates a different culture, different leadership, different innovation. You know, the book very much infuses all of that into a formula that if we're able to create, you know, this, as we create this think bigger course, and as we go into these companies and do strategy sessions and facilitating, um, our whole goal is to democratize that, that mindset and, and create that exponential mindset, belief and attitude so that everyone in the organization can think bigger because no longer can we just think about the people in the top where we've always done learning and development companies have and had their high high expo, high potential candidates you know go through an, a leadership but you know our our goal is to really have everybody think about that because it's part of the future of that company's existence is the fact that everyone and wherever they are and whatever point of view that they have in the company that they think bigger about what they're doing and and we've seen this have tremendous impact on very large organizations we work with. Um, and that's really the goal of the book is to summarize that 15 years of working with 10,000 plus executives in, you know, 90 plus countries to say, you know, there is a process for people to think bigger, especially with the speed and pace that everything's growing. Um, we're demanded to obviously, you know, you know, think bigger about our futures or we will be disrupted. And and I start there is that disrupt or you will be disrupted. Yeah, well said. And we'll jump into some of the companies that you've worked with, but also some of the examples that you, you talk about in the book as well. One of the notes I got from the book was really good. So after you after you finished up your education on the ship, you led an introspecting journey to Bali, spending time with some of the great energy healers as well, recharging, you know, working with shamans, fasting, all that kind of stuff in the Buddhist monastery as well, spending time in uh, isolation. But one of the things I like what you said, you said, you became mindful and embraced the joy of missing out, which is J-O-M-O. -O. Talk to me about the joy of missing out and what that means. Well, I, I think, you know, I'm very pro-technology. And, um, you know, with that, you have to embrace. And, and I have a, a quote in the book by Germany Kent um, that basically talks about social media as if, if you're not laughing, having fun, enjoying social media, then you're doing something wrong. And I, th I think it's a point of, uh, I have a love hate relationship with Facebook, just as probably many people do. And I, I talk about it in the book, but, um, the goal of, of technology should be able to make life easier. And part of the joy of missing out is the fact that you can choose what to be part of and not be part of. And every once in a while, I think it's very important for people to completely unplug. And that's part of my journey to Bali, part of, you know, I've spent uh, myself in isolation several on several different occasions in the wilderness uh, here in the Rocky Mountains, but also in Bali and fasting for, for 14 days at a time, really on an introspective journey to, to find like, how do I remove those obstacles? Um, and one of the things that I think where the current world is that I think is a, a real scare for the future 
is that we have this doom scrolling where we just scroll and scroll and scroll. And if you're not managing what information you consume, what information diet you have, um, it really impacts you. And, you know, I look at the future generations. I have a daughter that's uh, 13 going on 14 and, you know, her just, you know, compare culture and cancel culture and just being exposed to the amount of information, you know, no generation has had this kind of exposure to media so young in their lives, um, you know, with TikTok and just all the massive amounts of content. What it does is, is we're growing up faster. We're seeing things faster. So whatever we think we saw when we were kids and we're deviant, you know, and, and knowing that we were doing wrong by pushing ourselves into boundaries and expanding our own personalities, um, kids are forced to do that and their identities are completely being shaken because at all times they're comparing themselves to everyone and everyone's living a greater life. And that's, that's kind of what I teach companies about exponential is you may think you're the best at doing something, but there's actually someone in the world doing something better than you in every area. So no longer can you compare yourself. And I think what's important about the joy of missing out is, is when you get back to introspective and you get back to mindful and you bring it back to yourself, then you only compare it to yourself. Like, am I better than I was yesterday? Like, you know, and I'm very using technology to my advantage and I do a lot of biohacks and different things, but like I have a bed that monitors my sleep and it cool heats and cools and different things. And I've spent money on technology, uh, being an early adopter my whole life, but all these little things, now I only spend money on things that are going to improve the quality of my life and that actually help me miss out on the things so that I can focus on my big mission, which is 1 million exponential leaders. So getting eight hours of sleep, you know, taking a cold shower um, in the morning, waking up and really getting the vagus nerve and really the lymphatic system moving. I mean, all these little things help me actually w work towards peak performance. And part of that also is to just help me get into mindful, you know, and um, I had a company called Namaste Republic that um, I went on a, a journey and that was part of my Bali journey, which my daughter has the same name named after the island, Bali. And in that uh, journey, um, what I what I really learned is when I was most productive was when I had a clear mind and I was able to think big. And then I really were able to remove the limitations that were maybe created on the past. And that's where when I went to energy healers, what I realized is um, in, in some of these, you know, deep spiritual experiences, um, the, the traumas and the limitation and regrets that I literally were obstacles in front of my future. I was able to eat those obstacles. And I, and I say that is I was able to overcome those obstacles by literally saying, what was the meaning in me learning this lesson? And it led to something that later in the book, I kind of, I, I kind of allude to, but it's part of our think big course is that failure is part of life. But the reality is in my world, in my, in our company, 1 million exponential leaders, failure doesn't exist because we either win or learn. The only time we fail is if we don't learn and eventually we'll learn the lesson. <laughs> eventually, you know, we may have to fail a few times to learn that, but that's where the trauma and the obstacles and anything that's happened to us, it's not what happens to us. It's how we respond to it. I talk about that in the first chapter, um, is really part of this journey that helped me become exponential, that helped me help other organizations do things that they never thought was possible. And now it's helping me think about a mission that's bigger than myself and honestly seems, seems unrealistic to people. But that's the beauty of it is I get the greatness of every day, you know, waking up, you know, with the joy of missing out is not worrying about being a part of every little conversation because I'm actually worried about, I'm not worried, I'm just focused on my purpose and I'm focused on my massive transformative purpose, which is 1 million exponential leaders. And that's where like being on your podcast and if we impact a few people that pick up the book, that take the think bigger course, or actually just think bigger from hearing our thoughts, I couldn't be spending my time more wisely. And that's what I plan on doing every day for the rest of my life. And it feels great to find your purpose. And that's Another underlying message of the Think Bigger course, but also the book itself, is really to think about your massive transformative purpose. And that's a, a really a big thing that I focus on because once people find purpose, they don't they won't work another day in their life. You know, life, you know, the suffering of 
you know, what am I going to do and everything. And that is a, a journey and the obstacles appear for you to overcome them so that you actually find that someday. Um, and you can, you can choose, you know, I think in the Buddhist fashion, you can choose to suffer, but it is a choice. Well said. And just going back to uh, your mission on a million exponential leaders, I see myself as one of those exponential leaders. One of my goals is to educate a, a billion people through through book summaries and, and through information as well. I'm trying to democratize the, the whole book industry in terms of no one's got time to read. You might see all these books. You might go to a library or a bookshop and people become overwhelmed. It's very easy to watch a a Netflix uh, TV series, a show, or a movie because you just sit back and relax. I want to do that with the books. I want to bring books to life, whether that through video, through interviewing authors, or creating documentaries and things as well. So one of my goals is to serve a billion people through knowledge as well. So I'm up to about five or six million so far, so I've still got a way to go. But yeah, it, it's such a long-term vision that will outlive me that if I can affect if I can create this snowball and it, and it gets going, a lot of people are going to come by the way and help you push that snowball as well. And then it's going to go downhill and roll by itself as well. So yeah, I see myself as one of those exponential leaders as well. Moving on, I like how you wrapped up some of the universal truths in the book. And uh, some of the notes I got from that, which I'll read out is, you talk about we're always right. Uh, to think is to create. Your perception is your reality. You also talk about we are our habits. How we spend our day is how we spend our life. Focusing on personal habits, putting into work that will help us reach our goals. You also talk about attitudes, everything. It's not what happens to us, it's how we respond. What we resist persists, let it go, forgive. The goal is not the end, the journey is the reward, which I really love. Enjoy the process. And last, enjoy the moment. Now is all we've got. Is there anything you want to add on that or is there anything I've missed? Well, then there's we are all one, love unconditionally. So I think that's the... the the seventh universal that's right yeah i had seven then i wrote six down for some reason yeah perfect, perfect you know they're all interwoven but what these universal truths have meant to me is uh in my own travels i've really sought out you know and i, and I think it's what best book bites bits does so well is synthesizing information is is probably the greatest skill so if uh, any of your listeners i think the best thing they can do is read as many of your summaries as possible as quickly as possible because I think the themes and what you're doing, obviously, you're going to become an exponential. You are an exponential leader. You're on your path. You know, as as we talk about the, you know, there's a deceptive path that you will start to hit a exponential inflection point, which there's several of them in an exponential curve. But the fact that you know you've already you know summarized a thousand books and you're on your way or whatever, like there's tens of thousands of books of summarizing them in a way that people can synthesize that quickly. That's important in a world that's all about attention. And, you know, I'm looking forward to being part of that collection. And I think part of these universal truths that we come back to is how do we talk to ourselves? Because a lot of people say, well, how do I be exponential leader? And really, Michael, what you just summarized is how you become an exponential leader. You create a goal that's so big that you can work on forever. And whether you hit it or not does not matter. And it's, you know, I'll give you an example from the book um, that, that'll tie back in here, The Universal Truths. But Elon Musk, which um, I think is probably a, could be the mascot for exponential theory as an exponential leader, you know, set a goal, you know, for Tesla 15 years ago when he wrote a blog that basically stated that he would be where he is today by building a very expensive, very fast um, car, the Tesla Roadster, was able to sell those enough to then develop the Model S, which would be an overpriced luxury sedan uh, that eventually he would democratize cars. And he slowly has brought the car costs down to where, you know, candidly, a Model um, 3 is is a mid, mid-sized cost car, especially if you take out gas and different things, um, becomes very comparable to any any car owner in, you know, the Western world. So, as it further democratizes and we look at, you know, him democratizing the industry, you know, that's where I think a lot of us, you know, is thinking beyond, like, how does the industry think bigger about itself? And, but the key is the universal truths that Elon Musk and yourself, you know, if I compare you guys as exponential leaders, is if you believe, if you say to yourself, we're all to think is to create, you know, your goal is to, you know, you set a big goal I'm to democratize books for a billion people. 
And that what it is, the definition of exponential is a billion. And that's where a million exponential leaders will, Im will most certainly impact a billion people, if that makes sense. And that's, that's kind of the theory of my own goal. Um, but how you spend your days, that you're spending, you're putting in the time, you know, that goes to both the goals, not the end, that you're enjoying the process. Like this is just a habit of you creating this. And that's why you're at five to six million people, which is quite impressive. That's only going to accelerate as you kind of put more energy into this. And honestly, as you have different people on this that appeal to different, um, you know, basically categories of books and, and, you know, along that, but enjoying that. And then candidly, if you, you think about what you, if you're able to do what you did, you know, that's like loving unconditionally to the world. Like you're bringing your talent to the world. You said, I'm going to, I'm going to bite off this, no pun intended. Um, and I'm going to help a billion people obviously read these. Elon Musk has done the same thing by saying that about Tesla or SpaceX, where he even says, you know, I'm going to make a goal to civilize, you know, put civilization on Mars in 2040. The reality of that is, um, I'm sure you heard of moonshots by Google is really just Elon Musk is like, well, I got to think bigger than Google. So he says, let's create a Mars shot. And I, I write about this in the book and what he was able to do is say, I'm going to think so big and create such a big thinking that even if I fail, I succeed because he did that with Tesla too. He's actually probably further exceeded than he thought because in his mind, when he originally started, he thought he'd eventually put these batteries in other car companies like Mercedes and different car companies out there. But now he's the world's market capitalization of the largest company in the world. And that's what Exponential does is it you know, you will eventually reach a billion, but you'll eventually go beyond that. And, you know, I'll eventually go beyond a million. And that's the persistence of determination is that if we create longer term goals, we can think more exponentially. And in the book, I have a quote from uh, Bill Gates, who was really one of the first exponential thinkers that, you know, entered the technology scene creating Microsoft. But in 1976, he had a quote, you know, he created, uh, said I was going to put a computer on every desktop. What he underestimated is now the computer's in every pocket. So, you know, it's f beyond that. And he, he says a quote um, that we often kind of under overestimate what we're going to do in one year and underestimate what we're going to do in 10 years. And so much today has been brought to social media and with the stock market and analysts focus on today, we've got to break free from that and start thinking longer term. And even I have a quote in there about the Iroquois people that talks about they make decisions with seven generations in mind. Um, I'm not sure that CEOs today are thinking about seven minutes ahead because they're just reacting to the world. And that's where the joy of missing out, these universal truths, when you start breaking it down and just having a massive transformative purpose, you start to develop exponential theory where it becomes very clear that it's a formula for success into the future. It's a formula for where we will be in the future and where leaders will have the biggest impact. And the fact that you're focused on something and you have a very big idea of what you want to do with it. Um, ultimately, if you just keep persistently going at it, I mean, to reach five or six million people is exponential. Probably everyone in your hometown <laughs> was like, wow, I never, never thought Michael would, would do that. Um, but having that big goal and keeping on it um, is going to obviously is what exponential theory is about. And obviously when you think that big, you're bringing, you know, a conscious nature to the world is that that's going to help all of people, you know, if you're able to accomplish your goals. And, um, you know, I think it's a worthy endeavor. And that's why I was so excited to talk to you today. Yeah, well said. I want to expand on that quote you said. So a lot of people have heard that people underestimate what and I was, I was went out for breakfast with a, a friend yesterday and I, I actually said this to him. I said, I said, what are you, what's your 10 year goals? And break it down into two year increments. So if you've got a 10 year goal, break it down into how old are you now? If you're 27, well, what are your goals for 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32? So break it down into two years. But to expand on that, everyone's heard that, you know, you underestimate what you can do in, um, you overestimate what you can do in one year, but you underestimate what you can do in 10 years. No one's thinking about what they can do in 25 years, 50 years, 100 years, or even a thousand years. Meaning, what are you doing or what are you thinking about that can influence a generation? in a thousand years or a hundred years or 50 years or 25 years. Now, if the human species is still going around, I can tell you one thing that's going to be around, it's data and information and, you know, digital 
we're not going anywhere in terms of digital anything it's going to expand as, as as it is so in terms of information and and synthesizing data and breaking that up so for me i think i'm on that track where no books aren't books might go away but information's not going away conversations aren't going away humans uh we're such an analytical creature that we're just starving for not starving we're drowning in information but we're we're starving for knowledge and we and we want to know and unpack that as well so anyway that's just a little side note jumping in the book you talk about embracing vuca world so you talk about volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity what what what's your definition of the embrace in the uvca world well um so vuca you know was was created during the afghan war by the army because they just couldn't explain you know what was going on they didn't really understand all the different parties and people that are involved so it it became about you know it was a volatile uncertain complex and amb- ambiguous world and so vuca became this description of that war world um what, all, what ultimately uh, a guy named Bob Johansson, uh, Leaders Make the Future, uh, basically created this model around vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. And I really embrace that sentiment of the new VUCA mental model is when you have a vision and you can clearly articulate your massive transformative purpose, um, when you understand you have continuous communications, empathy, and you're really, you know, actively listening and emphasis on diversity and data. I think that leads to clarity where you can simplify, create expectations, and educate others, um, which leads to agility where you can experiment, learn, fail, and repeat. Um, you know, that's part of being exponential. And if you look at any of these exponential leaders, they've embraced, without knowing, they've embraced this new VUCA model because we live in such a volatile, uncertain complex and ambiguous world that we need something to be able to manage that. And I lead that in a lot of my consulting engagements. I really drive this home because so many people, I have this exercise um, around a business model canvas that we actually do with, you know, literally fortune 500 companies that we talk about the external environment. And this, this is a parallel metaphor for us is that we shouldn't let we should let external environments um, not guide us. We shouldn't be reactive to them, but we should lead in to where we think we should be with those. And we have to make decisions and make mistakes. Um, and I think that's part of the world is if we learn faster, you know, that's part of every one of these exponential leaders in this book that we wrote is that they've learned to experiment faster than their peers. And they've learned to embrace failure in a way that it is either learning or winning, as I, I said before. And I think the new VUCA model with the accelerating speed of innovation, um, you know, with the fact that we still have hardware in our head that's 10,000 years old, our brain still has fight, you know, flight, fight, fight, fright, or freeze, you know, we're really, you know, should we run, should we, you know, freeze, or should we, you know, get out of there? I mean, so I think that flight, fright, I'm kind of messing up those words, but freezing on that is where so many of our leaders are today when i go into a company that it's like literally helping them to you know take a little back and part of that is to get back to you know and this goes to a little bit of what we talked about for before the joy of missing out and getting back to what is your longer term vision um and establishing that and getting people to understand that and understand you're gonna to have to pivot along the way as the world changes, but you need to be in charge of that change. You need to disrupt yourself, not to let the world disrupt you. And that's part of this book that kind of lays out, but that new VUCA model is central to a lot of conversations I have um, because it leads throughout the book. And that's what's uh, applicable when you read all these different leaders, they've embraced that. And um, that was part of my 15 years of research is you saw these small companies, they, they really much act very differently because they're focused on solving one big problem where these big companies were like, well, we're, we're not able to do that. Well, then you're likely not to exist in the future. And that's what we're seeing with the S&P 500 companies um, has shrunk from about 57 years in the 1950s, 60s uh, to really down to 10 years now um, today. So, I mean, you're, you're seeing a very, your life cycle of companies is, you know, it's not overnight yet, but with technology companies, we're seeing shorter and shorter spans of, of what they are. 
mostly because they don't have a vision, you know, an exponential vision like the one you have or I have where, you know, regardless of what happens, we're going to be working on this vision, you know, well into the future. And, um, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of other leadership firms that won't exist that, um, you know, I'll continue on my path because I have this uh, massive transformative purpose. Yeah, yeah, well said. And one of the things you, you jump in in Chapter 3 is thinking exponentially. You talk about sort of the top five uh, technology companies in the, in the Western Hemisphere, which we all know, and we interact with these global brands every day in some sort of way, which is Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. And we know the founders of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, you've got Steve Jobs, Sergio Brand, you've got Bill Gates, you've got Jeff Bezos as well, and how these companies grew, you know, exponentially using technology. What a lot of people don't know, talk to us about how Domino's and Starbucks changed their business model by turning their companies in not to a food and beverage company, but a technology company, and how the power of technology can really accelerate your company when you start thinking of yourself as, you know, as a technology company versus a, you know, a, a bricks and mortar company. Yeah, I, th- I think the, the, the clear um, breakthrough that I had in, in identifying this was the fact that Domino's outperformed those top five global companies that have grown beyond belief. If you invested in any of them, you would have done incredible, whether it's Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, or, or Tesla. And, you know, we've seen those grow exponentially. But you look at Domino's and it, it actually 112 x itself over that, ten, that same 10 year period. Uh, in the book that we talk about it and partially is because they they just burn the boats and embrace technology where they build a platform that managed all aspects of their business um, able obviously able to thrive you know during the downturn because of their at home delivery model and such but globally um, they won the pizza wars you know and um, you know they are in every market that they are in they 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 begin to dominate just because they're so much more efficient at what they did and they literally launched that with a campaign that they, they said our product is crap, you know, at the start of that 10 years. And they said the whole industry is crap. And I think that's what you'll see about, um, you know, I guess exponential leaders is they're not just there to, you know, impact what they're doing to their company. They're there to impact the industry or even shift and, and know that they're going to impact multiple industries. Um, and Domino's and Starbucks both embraced basically building on a platform and technology to where they led with technology. And now, you know, Starbucks, uh, near half the revenue, literally walks in and out, doesn't have an interaction, lowers the, the cost of customer acquisition, the cost of uh, customer time and, and such. So, and they also have on their app, um, when we wrote the book and in the research about, I guess it's probably a year ago, they had $1.6 billion in prepaid drinks. So they're bigger than, Many banks, you know, just have an application that people are buying their drinks ahead of time and, and obviously getting rewards and, and obviously getting nudged through behavioral economics every day to say, hey, stop by this afternoon and get a tea. Um, all these things have really driven both of those Starbucks and, um, and Domino's to win the pizza and coffee wars. And um, on a, you know, on a system, it doesn't mean that there's not better in different markets around the world. But what they've done is with their market share, they've they've really, you know, just been that much more efficient. But they've also been rewarded uh, by the market because they're embracing of technology. And they really became technology companies that sold pizza and coffee, not uh, necessarily a coffee house. And we um, we see other, you know, other companies um, that we outline in the book. You know, there's a lot of companies that we can see why technology has you know, if they embraced it from the beginning, they were able to kind of go exponential. And that's part of it is just to really understand that business model that we lay out, you know, 10 steps of a framework to really help people, you know, go through how do you create an exponential company? How do you create an exponential mindset? Um, and that's, that's, you know, there's just a lot of learnings from all these different companies that have embraced digitization and technology and led it all the way to, you know, through the six Ds that uh, Peter Diamantes and Steve Kotler created. Um, where it gets to democratization. And that's, democratization is usually at that point where a leader is saying, I'm going to change the industry. And Domino's, um, the CEO, you know, basically stated is we as a company can do better, but our industry has to do better because we're all serving crap pizza. And um, really, you know, was embraced from that on and obviously rewarded uh, for, 
you know, being honest and then really making the right investments, which I think is what we, you know, when we go into leaderships and help companies, we help them make those decisions um, so that they obviously can make the right investments into their long-term future. And that's where Domino's still, you know, really is, um, as far as the delivery, you know, lower in cost pizza, they, they pretty much dominate it uh, here in the United States and in other markets in Europe and different places where they, they reign. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much to unpack in the book as well. And for my audience out there, please go out and, and buy the book. It's, it's definitely amazing. Uh, one thing you talk about in the book is Salim Ismail's book on exponential organizations. And, and you talk about exponential organizations using the acronym of ideas and scale, which is sort of interfaces, dashboards, experimentation, autonomy, and social technologies as well. And that's really just embracing the side of, hey, how do you scale a company? Well, you scale with proven technologies and proven concepts that have worked with other companies as well. And then you talk about sort of external external scaling, which is yet staff on demand, community and crowd, algorithms, leveraged assets and engagement. So I'm not sure if you want to add or talk about uh, any of those things before we sort of wrap up. I think we could probably spend another three hours talking about going through the book, but I'll leave it to the audience to go out there and buy the book and, and read it as well. But is there anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, Salim's actually coming out with a second book to kind of update that one. That was written in 2014, and I worked with him at Singularity University, and, and he has a network called OpenXO that I'm involved in, actually helping with the second book, Exponential Organizations. But what Salim uncovered was, for the first time, is how these companies did this, and that's part of the basis of my research. Um, I was entrepreneur in residence at Singularity University. He was president of that. He, you know, was part of it that Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamantis started Singular University. For those that don't know what it is, it's at NASA Ames campus in Mountain View, California, which is literally a block away from Google's headquarters. So it's right in the mix of Silicon Valley. Um, I actually went there and, and had an apartment on campus at NASA and got to hang out with exponential, you know, thinkers and, and entrepreneurs um, for, for four or five, actually for a year. And in that experience, um, you just saw how the world, when you're around other people that think big, you think bigger. Uh, Salim then identified, you know, what, are, what does it take to make a company? And the one variable in the list that you gave right there is massive transformative purpose. And I've said it a few times is all these companies, like you have, a, you have an MTP of reaching a billion people. I have one that reaches a million exponential leaders. Um, if you name any company, Google was to organize the world's information. Um, you know, Tesla is to, to bring electric, you know, electric cars to the world. I mean, it, and now it's even to be an energy company beyond that. So you see these expanding mindsets and beliefs around massive transformative purpose. And then out of that laundry list of things that you said is all exponential organizations that have been able to grow at an exponential rate have held four plus of those attributes so they've done four of those very very well and when i say very well they're like best in class so it becomes like how do you if if you want the recipe for becoming an exponential organization slim ishmael's kind of identified that part of that is i wanted to build on that and create exponential theory is how do you help leaders become you know more conscious and more exponential so i think there's a, a series of books by peter diamantis of bold and abundant that, you know, you look at different exponential, uh, you know, kind of leaders are talking about this subject. Those are the people that I aspire to kind of help change the world with because they're right now have pushed the knowledge on helping people to see the exponential curve, which candidly, we think linearly, we've always been, and that's part of our past, you know, is we look at chronology of we've done this and this and this and this, but as you know, Michael, you, you start to hit an exponential curve and you know things start to take off and then your world just expands. And that's part of thinking bigger. And that's what I hope to help individuals through my course, as well as executives, companies, and you know people that are career oriented help go through that because the overall goal of exponential theory is to make the world a better place. The overall goal of 1 million exponential leaders is literally to solve every problem in the world. And I'm so happy to have you as another exponential leader in this world and uh, committed to something big because I think that's the more people we can help think bigger, you know, the bigger impact I can make. That's the best thing that I can do. And that's what I've realized is 
with my own set of knowledge and experiences, it's brought me here to this point where I'm exactly where I need to be to help people obviously see the, their own exponential future, to see abundance, um, to build exponential organizations. And I think those are all part of the, the overall goal um, you know, of, of all of us in the exponential world is um, none of, you know, it's interesting about what I did research in all these leaders is a lot of people talk about the wealth of some of these exponential leaders. Um, when you really get down to hearing about their passion and their purpose, it was never about the money. The money came after the fact that they were solving a very, very big problem. And um, so many people criticize people because they have money. But, you know, now we're seeing exponential philanthropy, which uh, I talk about in the last book, which could help us, you know, really solve a lot of these problems that are plaguing us right now, whether they're civil rights issues or climate change or some of these other issues that are seem so big and overwhelming. If we get enough exponential leaders thinking about them, um, we'll be able to, to obviously solve those problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well said. And yeah, thank you for the book and thank you for all the work uh, that you've done as well. I think it's a good point to sort of wrap up the podcast as well. We can, uh, as I said, we can chat for ages as well. Where can people find out more about you Buy the book? What's the, the best place? Yeah. On Instagram, Aaron bear, A A R O N B A R E. Um, you can, you can actually Aaron bear.com A A R O N B A R E.com. Um, and then, you obviously can find information there and that'll lead back to several different places. Exponentialtheory.com obviously has the book. Um, we have uh, 1 million exponential leaders.com, 1mxl.net. So we have a lot of different uh, domains that'll lead back. But uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I have an ongoing communication on my Instagram. Um, I've kind of chosen that as the platform right now of, of uh, disseminating my message and uh, a lot of the book and some of the messages are in there. So it's, it's um, you know, it's it's part of my overall communications to be exponential and it's growing exponentially. It's It's been interesting to see as I publish the book, how, how that's grown and how, um, how impactful me having these conversations actually has helped my world grow. So thank you for, for doing what you do. Awesome. Now to my audience out there, yeah, please go out there, buy the book and yeah check out uh, aaron on uh, instagram as well so um yeah thank you again and uh thanks for being on the best book bits podcast enjoy the rest of your day all right thanks michael